Good evening, Large Wine of Amerinic. It's Thursday, November 19th, 2015. I'm Kat Galliano, and welcome to The Local Live. With candles and songs, our community pays its respect to the victims of the Paris atrocities. Love, love, love. Local balloon busts. Police arrest two men for pirating movies at Balloon World in Larchmont. Will Mamaroneck Avenue Elementary host a school-based health center? Keep watching for the latest update. What popular local stories are trending? More in our segment, In the Media. Need a little holiday spirit? Love classic musicals? It feels like Christmas at the Sandbox Theater. And don't go anywhere because our Mamaroneck Girls Field Hockey State Champions are here in studio to share their victory. Tell us what you think. In person, over the phone, online. Watch and hear yourself on TV. You tell us, we air it. This is The Local Live. Good evening, Large Money Mamaroneck. I'm Rebecca Paganini, and welcome to The Local Live. Last Tuesday, about 300 people from our community congregated at the village of Mamaroneck Memorial on Mount Pleasant Avenue with candles and songs to commemorate the, loss, the lives lost during the terrorist attacks in Paris. This is a human tragedy that has occurred. In French, we would call it de la folie totale. Total folly. Teens from the Westchester Sandbox Theater Group shared what it meant to them to sing at this candlelight vigil. Someone once said that where words fill, music speaks. And tonight, music and singing has proven us that we can stand together. It was a, a great moment to be able to be uh, solid, solidaire, all together. I've got a couple friends in Paris. Thankfully, they were all right. I'm really happy that I had this opportunity to sing in front of these people and to be here with these people in this moment. It was beautiful. <laughs> I realized like there are things that aren't affecting me that are affecting other people every day and that's something really heavy to think about so I think I'm going to remember this day for a long time. French, French member of our community Aline Vincent sent to us quote, it is important to share the message of love and hope to Paris. I want to show my family the video of this vigil to let them know that they are not alone. On behalf of the LMC TV and the production team at the local live, we want to express our condolences and our sol solidarity with the community of the French American School of New York here in Large Mont and Mamaroneck, many of whose members are of French origin. This Monday at the Village of Larchmont Municipal Meeting, Police Chief John G. Poloway reported on an October 29th arrest at Balloon World, a local business located on Palmer Avenue. Chief Poloway stated that under a series of undercover operations involving the purchase, purchasing of counterfeit goods, they were able to seize more than 50,000 bootleg discs and equipment. The products were described by LPD officials as DVD burning hardware, computers and software, and packaging materials, an aggregate of counterfeit mu movies and mu music discs in excess of $50,000. The counterfeit videos and music that were seized are estimated to be worth $100,000. With an anonymous tip that counterfeit movies were being sold at the location. Working in conjunction with representatives from the Motion Picture Association of America and the music industry, the counterfeit video and music disc seized were estimated to be valued in excess of $100,000. Felix Ronaldo and Robert Donati were charged with felony trademark counterfeit in the first degree. The two men were arraigned on Friday in the Justice Court of Larchmont, with Ronaldo being released and his bail set at $3,000. Donati, unable to make bail, was transported to the Westchester County Jail. At the Mamaroneck School Board meeting last Tuesday, the proposal of creating a school-based health care center at Mamaroneck Avenue Elementary reappeared on the agenda. Last time this proposal was discussed at the end of, was at the end of January after school the school-based health center tax, task force did a presentation for the board. 
At that time, the board decided that Superintendent Dr. Shapps would be in charge of finding the, an objective third party professional to conduct an assessment about the unmet health care requirements for children at Mamaroneck Avenue School. The board asked Dr. Shapps to try to identify an objective third party professional to conduct an assessment of unmet health care needs for children at Mamaroneck Avenue School. Dr. Shapps contacted the Center for Health Care Analytics which is based in the Hagen School of Business at Iona College. A subcommittee of the board, consisting of me, Jim Needham, and Melanie Gray, reviewed an initial proposal from Paul Savage, the center's director. We felt it was too expensive and too broad for our district, and we asked him to pare it back. In front of us uh, tonight is a greatly reduced proposal to analyze records captured in the New York State Department of Health's Statewide Planning and Research Cooperative System, or SPARCS, and a similar <coughs> Connecticut database to uncover whether children in the 10543 zip code lack a medical home. With discussion between board members and the comments from the public, the board spent one hour talking about the open door assessment proposal. Let's take a listen to what residents had to say. The building owner of 689 Mamaroneck Avenue said that the clinic is expected to open this spring. <clears throat> And I think Ann can tell you at the Healthier Mamaronic meeting, at that meeting, someone said they're opening by the end of the year. So with that being said, um, I just feel like if you're going to spend this money to do the study, now is not the time to do it because mm -hmm. the results will be obsolete by the time the clinic opens and you'll have to do another study. And I guess what you're really dealing with here is the cost is assessing. So I just so hope that it will have some positive um, uh, evaluation from you in terms of just such a basic need when you do not have a cost, but an additional enhancement for these children. And anything that helps a little bit to me is so worth it, and I don't see a downside. President of the board, Anne LeBeau, said that the board will revisit the proposal from the Center of Health Analytics carefully before making a decision. After residents noted that the open door may be opening a community health center two blocks from the Mamaroneck Avenue School very soon, the board decided to find out the exact dates of the opening before doing the assessment. Remember to log on to www.lmctv.org to have access to the full recordings of municipal meetings and school board meetings. Watch out for the full collection of our videos online. Now it's time for this week's In the Media with Christian Gobiowski. <laughs> Hammocks Middle School is the first public school in New York to have a rocket composter, which was made possible by a grant from the Mamaroneck Schools Foundation. The rocket composter will produce compost that the school will use in its garden and greenhouse. The compost will also be available to community members to use on their lawns and other grassy areas. For more information, the full article can be found at earthtalk.org. Do you have trouble getting your vision of fashion out of your mind and onto the runway? Well, you're in luck because on November 29th, the Larchmont Public Library will be holding an introduction to sewing class geared towards teens. At the class, you will learn basic sewing machine techniques and create a unique bag. For more information, check out the Mamaroneck Hamlet Hub. With Black Friday coming up, you might think that you need to wake up extremely early to get the best deals in holiday shopping. But a recent study has found that many of the deals are recycled. So with all the hype of Black Friday, you might be wondering which stores are worth your while. Check out the patch for a full list of which stores have the most recycled deals. These are the popular stories in our local media. I'm Kristen Gobiowski. Coming up, we'll be talking in studio with our field hockey state champions who tell us all about their victory the second year in a row. Now it's time for our weekly trivia question.
Welcome back to The Local Live. I'm Rob Moretti here with Mike Wich. We're joined tonight by some very special guests, but in order to properly introduce them, let's go back to this past Sunday at Maine Endwell High School, just outside of Binghamton in upstate New York. Here are the highlights from the New York State Class A Field Hockey Championship game. Hey there, sports fans. Rob Moretti here with the highlights of the Class A state final in field hockey. The Mamaroneck Tigers and Ward Melville Patriots both trying to earn the right to call themselves state champions. We'll pick this one up in the second half. Nine minutes in off a corner, Ward Melville's Kira Alventosa flips one towards the goal and whoa, that did not miss by much. My goodness. Ten minutes later, Lexi Reinhardt takes on a Mariner goalie Charlotte Mackey, who not only saves it, but kicks it off Reinhardt and out of bounds to end the Patriots' threat. Mamaronik had chances as well. Here, a Grace Fitzgerald pass is deflected by Megan Mullaney, but just wide to the right. A scoreless tie through regulation. Let's move ahead to overtime. Format is 7-on-7 seven seven with sudden victory on a goal. Three minutes in, Mullaney's shot is saved by Patriots keeper Emily Hoey. Rebound try for Fitzgerald, but handled by Kate Mullum. We play on. Down on the other end, it's Reinhardt into traffic and cleared out by Paige Danahy. Just a few seconds later, Reinhardt again. Mackey comes out and cuts it off. Following minute, Sean Davenport rips one high. Mackey with the leaping save. Then kick saves the rebound attempt. Patriots still threatening, but Mackey up to the task. Ward Melville would then earn three straight penalty corners to close out the first overtime. On the second one, it's Mackey again robbing Davenport. Tigers would hold on to send the game into double overtime. A minute in, Kerry Thornton makes some space, but shoots it wide. Then, a two-on-none chance for Ward Melville, but Charlotte Mackey would have none of that. Way out of her usual spot to make the play. Four minutes later, Bridget Knowles and Lizzie Clark both get a chance to end it. Can't send it home, but they do earn a penalty corner. On that corner, Clark sends it on goal. Rebound comes to Knowles. Yahtzee! The Mamaroneck Tigers are state champions in field hockey for the second consecutive year and third time in school history. Charlotte Mackey called her Katniss Everdeen because she was the girl on fire. Ten saves officially in the shutout and for Coach John Savage, his 300th coaching win. Make sure you tune in this weekend to watch this game in its entirety on LMC TV, Cablevision Channel 77, Verizon Fios Channel 34, at 9.20 p.m. and 2.20 p.m. Hey, what a game. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. That's a day that will certainly go down as one of the best in uh, the history of Mamaroneck Athletics. Uh, let's meet our guests for the evening from the back-to-back -back state champion Mamaroneck Tigers field hockey team who finished the season with 20 wins, one loss, and one tie. We have uh, in the center is senior co-captain Grace Fitzgerald. Uh, to her right, your left on screen is head coach John Savage. And on the far right of your screen is assistant coach Trisha Miller. Uh, first off, uh, congratulations to all of you on a job well done uh, again. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also joined tonight by Mike Witch, who will be fielding, field hockey, uh, fielding questions via email and Twitter. Uh, you can also call into the show. At the phone number at the bottom of your screen, it's uh, it's 3810150. So this is your chance to ask that burning question to these three. We have them here, so don't delay. So while you get mm -hmm. those set, we're gonna. I have a question for you to, to start things off. Uh, last year, you you win the championship five nothing. It's kind of not really a laugher, but you're kind of able to coast through that game, knowing uh, what the end result would be through through most of it. Uh, this year, obviously, the exact opposite. Uh, which win for you is more enjoyable? Well, at the end, this year was more enjoyable. As we're going through it, uh, it's not enjoyable at all. It's a very stressful situation. So at the end, it was very satisfying for me because of the young ladies who, who fought the war and came out on the other side. Gracie? 
-hmm. This year, definitely, the victory was just so much sweeter because we just had to work so much harder for it. Like, like Sab, I was like watching these reruns and like cringing, like, oh my god. <laughs> but it was just <laughs> awesome, and I couldn't be happier. How about you, Coach Miller? You know, all, all the wins are, are satisfying for us, but it's so much, you feel like you earned it so much more when you have to go through a fight like that with these kids, you know. They, they really worked hard from the beginning. A lot of people doubted this team because we graduated so many people last year, which we actually do do every year, but everybody had a lot of doubt in these girls. So to let them come through like this, to me, really felt good for them. And it seemed mm -hmm. like uh, every time uh, that it looked like you were going to lose, Charlotte Mackey was right there to, to really save your bacon uh, every time, especially in overtime. I think she had 10 saves overall. Uh, I guess more of a question for the coaches here. Uh, how impressed were you with how Charlotte matured throughout the year? She didn't even know she was going to be the starting goalie uh, in, until early in the season or maybe been preseason because of the, uh, the injury to, to your last year's goalie, Jamie Schiff. Uh, it was a process. Uh, last year up at States, uh, Charlotte almost got the starting uh, job in the championship game. We told her we believed in her. If we, we, if we had put her in at that time, we'd believe that she could be successful. This whole year, it's been a learning process where we tried to convince her that we had the faith in her, which we did. And as she grew and as we played more competition, you could see she started to believe that she belonged there. And to be quite frankly, I, frank with you, I didn't think that type of game was in her repertoire right now as a junior but she saved the best for last and uh, put it on the line and when the team needed her she rose to the occasion. Um, that final game too it, it's an absolute pressure cooker um, it, it's so much of a stark contrast um, from a lot of the games you played during the regular season I know I was at a game that was six nothing earlier this year played in a rainstorm um, but you do have games on your regular schedule that you always put like Lakeland, Rye, uh, Darien, another team in Connecticut. Uh, how much does the scheduling those games help you when you come to a tough opponent like uh, Ward Melville at the end there? Well, it, it prepares you to perform at the high level. We, we try and convince the girls that every game is the most important game of the season and that they need to perform at the highest level. And sometimes they look at us like we're crazy when the score's 5 nothing, but we're not happy with the way they're playing. So we're, our job is to get them to play at that level every single moment so that when they're in a, a game like Ward Melville, they know what to do. It comes natural. They've been doing it all year long. Can I ask a non-analytical question? Absolutely. Um, I read in the paper that there was a little bit of a controversy up in Rye because boys were given permission to play on the girls' team. Is that the case in Mamaronek as well? Are boys allowed to play? It's, um, you know, Title IX says everybody should have an opportunity. Uh, my belief, and I've, I've made it public, is that a school district should supply a variety of sports, not every sport. In other words, because we have a field hockey team for girls, should we have a field hockey team for boys? Well, if there's an interest and, and a number of people want to come out, that's fine. I believe that field hockey, in, right now as it now stands in Maranek, is a girl's sport. And I would be very upset if I had to send a girl home that she didn't make the team or she was sitting on the bench because a boy was playing. So that's just my opinion. There are other opinions out there. Um, call me old school, but it's a girls' sport, and girls do it quite well, and I just like to con continue as a girls' sport. And it's been a girls' sport for over 100 years, hasn't it? Well, in, in Europe, men and women play the sport, mm -hmm. and they have their own... It's not a tennis club, it's a field hockey club where the parents go to one side and the children go to the other side. So it's in their culture as opposed to in the United States here. Yeah. I also noticed when I'm new to this game, uh, having embarrassed myself by telling people that we had the lacrosse team coming on tonight. Sorry, folks. Sorry, folks. <laughs> um, but uh, I noticed that uh, there was one person on the field who was well protected. Uh, what other protection do you girls wear? Because there's a lot of possibility for injury. Yes, there is. I mean, I've like three, I one set of stitches in my face from playing field hockey from two preseasons ago. But it's just like all part of the game really helps with your reflexes, I guess. But I'm never worried about getting injured like with the ball or stick when I'm going out there. I just want to focus on the game. So I'm not concerned, really. Is, is that something that the teams are looking at to provide more safety, more padding somewhere for the players? Well, I, I think 
The answer is yes to that. I think it starts with the coaches teaching the game how to, how to play it properly and safely. Uh, the coaches in, in Section 1 do a great job of having the girls play defense but not getting too close when somebody's swinging the stick. Do not try to defend from behind. Do not go low on the ground. So I think the game is taught quite well with safety as our primary issue. Are there accidents? Yes, in, in any sport, in any competition, there can be accidents. But I think the coaches in Section 1 teach the kids. The kids learn. We never want to put them in jeopardy. We tell them, it, err on the side of safety. And I think if you look at our sport, for the, just the shin guards, the mouth guards, and the goggles, the serious injuries that have happened, God willing, have been very, very few and far mm. between. And I think that comes with the coachings and how the kids play the game, the respect they have for each other. Yeah, and in high school, we wear goggles, a mouth guard, and shin guards. In college, they don't even wear goggles. They just wear a mouth guard and shin guards. Wow. Um, uh, I remember a lot of times after we cover a game, I'll talk to Coach Savage and ask him about what he thought about the game. And he always points out that the girls are always working hard. Um, how much work is that exactly, uh, just in terms of practice time? I don't know if you look at film. Uh, team activities away from the field, uh, work in the off season. Gracie? Well, like you said, um, like we do so much team activities off the field. Like we have team dinners every night or a team breakfast before a game and it really helps bond us. Like no other sport at the school has anything like that and it really makes us closer and I think it reflects the chemistry on the field as well and practice we always go 100% at practice like Sav and Miller are always pushing us to be our best like sometimes like this was we always talked about this during the season like not to stop when you think that you've like hit your peak like there's always more inside of you to push yourself and I think that's part of it like mentally we're tough and able to push ourselves as well. Yeah, yeah. I invite the audience again we've got a few more minutes to uh, talk to the uh, winners, the state champs, two years in a row here from the Marinick High School uh, varsity field hockey team. Uh, you can call us, you can tweet, or you can email your question or your comment, or maybe just a congratulations to the team. While we wait for that, um, I, I do have a question that came in earlier t uh, in the week to me from our former sports producer, Seth Rothman. Uh, he wanted to know, generally speaking, uh, so the team Defenseman's championships, and the team gave up, I don't know, it was less than 10 goals, I think, for the Ten entire goals, season. 10 goals, exactly. Uh, what makes the defense so dominant? Is it, uh, is, it, um, uh, is it just talent and hard work, or is there a, a coaching scheme that goes in with that, or, or what is it that makes it? Because I'd have to say one of the top three defenses in the area. Well, I think you, you have to have players that are willing to work hard. Uh, that's the foundation of everything we do. Um, they listen. We talk to them about angles and lanes. Uh, I have a basketball background, so they're constantly hearing me say, where's the ball, where's the line of the ball? Meaning, if the ball has to get to the person you're guarding, can you get to that ball first on the line of the ball? And once they started understanding the line of the ball, and I don't have to be face-to-face, -face, I can be off my player, but still stop her from getting the ball. And I need to keep the goal, I need to stay between the goal and my girl. These are things they hear constantly from the modified up to the varsity. So by the time they're a varsity player, they, they play very good defense. We pride ourselves on not letting the other team score. That's you know, some of the things we take a look at as we go through the season. Can you uh, tell our viewers why you're being called uh, Mr. 300? These days? <laughs> the, gentleman, the gentleman to my right asked me to take a picture up at States holding the two Tigers, and mm -hmm. I figured it was a friendly thing to do. <laughs> so as a result of that, Mr. Tweeter over here decided to... Oh, we to have the photo. It's up. Oh, brother. Yeah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> he sent it out, and I don't do Facebook or tweet. I stay out of trouble, and people are coming up to me and say, hey, Mr. 300, and I, don't, I have no idea what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And finally, somebody showed me. I said, okay, so he got me. We got him the year before with the the peace sign behind him, and I guess I had to pay for that. <laughs> and now, where, where do those Tigers come from, and are they going to be a permanent staple now that you've had success with them? We've had them for years. The, the gardeners, I think, purchased one of them, and maybe one of the other parents purchased. And I must admit, <laughs> these young ladies are very superstitious. If there's not the right <laughs> amount of balloons or the type of balloon or the tiger, and I'm like, really, girls? 
Miller goes to me, don't mess with that, Sab. Don't even try, because <laughs> that'll mess with their head. There has to be a certain amount of balloons and tiger. So as a result, we got two tigers that we carry around, and the balloons have to show up, and <laughs> there's a whole, whole set of things we have to do in Whatever order to play works. a field hockey game. I guess it works. <laughs> uh, let me interject. I, when I asked you about the Mr. 300, I thought you were going to admit that you've got 300 wins now. It, it was it was a gift that these young ladies gave to me, and I, I wasn't going to mention it because I'm I'm a team player, and it's all about the team, and it's all about them. Um, so I didn't mention it. I told Coach Millen, she goes, "Oh wow!" I said, "But don't say anything." But then when we got it was the 300th win because of how special this team was, I needed to let them know that they gave me a gift, and in order to do that, I had to tell them this was my 300th win. Thank you very much. It's a gift I'll always remember. And, this is a special group of kids who had to work real hard to their potential, and they earned everything this year. So I, mm -hmm. I thought sharing that with them, that they gave me this gift, was heartwarming for me, and, and they were excited about mm -hmm. it, too. Can we show this uh, Grace, plaque here? Sure. Which camera, Justin, should we show it to? It has all of fingerprints. Your camera? Out. I guess. There we go. <laughs> Where is that going to be uh, displayed now? As, as you walk in the athletic office, there's uh, containers on the wall, and mm -hmm. we have another two of these there, as well as regional and sectionals. W what people might not realize is this program has been in sectionals 12 years in a row, winning nine of them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to get back-to-back -back is, is really quite an accomplishment, but we've kind of set the framework with hard work. Good things happen to people that work hard. Uh, we actually have an email that's come in just now uh, from a Brian who wants to know how many practices do you do in a day? Just well during um, preseason we used to have two a day, so two hour practices. But now we, just, for pieces we have like one four hour practice and then just one during regular season. It doesn't seem like a lot, but you know it's a lot well, on the we body. We do six days a week. We, yeah. we practice six days a week. And is there still time for math and science and yes, all these the girls other stuff? are yes. all these girls are all um, you know they're all on academic high honors. They take their all their APs. A lot of these girls are getting into the best colleges. A lot of them go on and play field hockey in college, and so they're all they all have very high academics. And John and I are very proud of the fact that they all. They all have very high academic averages, and they all do very well in school. And they're recognized by New York State as a scholar-athlete team, which means mm -hmm. in the first semester, average of 90 or better. Mm -hmm. And we've had that ever since the last 15 years. They've been scholar-athletes team. So we get the best of the best, which helps us in our and coaching. Maybe we should mention that Lizzie uh, Clark, who was supposed to be here with us but is in a pace performance and couldn't get out, wasn't she just named? She was athlete. chosen a, a Con Ed winner, which is the elite of the elite, and it's based on academics, athletics, and community service. And it's boys and girls competing for the honor, and they choose one a week. There's 38 winners. So it's a very prestigious award, in my opinion, because it's the whole child, not just the athletics. Hmm. We have another email. May I? Absolutely. Uh, this person asks, after winning two years in a row, do you feel pressure to win next year, too? Well, this is my last year, but we were talking to the girls after the win. We were like, okay, now you have to create a dynasty. Like, you have to have three <laughs> Pete next year. Like, this isn't it. So, yeah, I think the team next year is going to be great as well and to continue the winning streak, hopefully. Just a, a quick story, if I may, coming back on the bus. I'm in the front, and I hear from the back, where is this thing next year? <laughs> and, and they say, Maine Enwell. Oh, all right, that's good. We'll be back here. I turned around, that was a ninth grader, yeah. Bridget Knowles, who scored the goal, saying that. Uh -huh. That's a ninth grader. <laughs> so the goal is to get there. If we work hard, maybe good things will happen again. Hmm. Rob? Um, well, while we're talking about Bridget, you had um, an unusual number of uh, call-ups from the junior varsity for the sectionals. Obviously, Bridget goes ahead and scores the goal. Uh, how does that infusion of youth into the team late in the season kind of change the team dynamic, if, if it does at all? I, I don't think it does at all with this particular group. It may with other groups. This particular group, we took up seven. Usually we take up the captains, and it's, it's a reward for being the captains and doing a good job. Maybe three, maybe four people max. This group is an exceptional group of youngsters. And the bottom line is 
after the first 10 days of practice, we scrimmage varsity against JV. So our JV with Coach Miller's instructions, and, and believe me, we would not have 300 if we were not a team. If I was by myself, I don't think I'd be even close to that. So the team we have and the coaching helps. But this group scrimmage is the best team in the state every single day. So by the end of the season, we've had games where we beat them one nothing or there's a 0-0 tie. So they come into it like, hey, just put me in, coach, and I'll do the job. And that's something great that Coach Miller has instilled in them, the confidence to compete. Yeah, they're a little overwhelmed that first week. But once they get their feet wet and they realize I can take care of this, they come to us, uh, they come to me on the varsity level completely ready to be a varsity player. And that's why Bridget was able to step in in one of the biggest moments in, in Marinick history and, and perform. Now, we, I see 11 girls on the field at any time, but there are more than that on the team, right? Mm -hmm. How many? There's 25 on the varsity. When we, brought them, when we brought those girls up, there was 25. We had 17 pretty much throughout the season, and then we brought those girls up when we had 25. Very nice. I've got a question. Go right um, ahead. So you know, we're talking about you know, how great this, this team has been for the last 10, 15 years. Um, the first time you won the state in 2004, you had to get through a really tough program in Lakeland to get to states. They're a Class B school now, so how, um, how has that changed your relationship with that program? Is it more mutual admiration now than adversarial? I, I think that's true. In, in any situation like that, when you're competing against somebody who could take your dream away, it's a little more adversarial. Um, Sharon Sarson is the best coach in Section 1 in, in New York State and maybe in the country. She puts her heart and soul and, into the program, and her kids love her, and they play for her, and they play year-round, and that's what makes them so successful. We took that model and kind of brought it down to Mamaroneck, and, and in order to beat Lakin, we had to go out there and believe that we could first and then go out and do it. And we did that in 2004, beat them for the sectional championship and went on to win the states. And we competed with them for two or three years after that, one nothing game. So I think anybody that wants to be successful in field hockey, take a look at Lakeland and, and model your program and get your kids to work as hard as her kids work. I have a, a question for Grace, if I might. What is it that you want our viewers to know about your team that you haven't maybe mentioned yet? Well, I feel like I always say how close we are as a family, and like even when we pulled the like younger girls up, like four of them were freshmen. It's just like they're like our little sisters, and I just think I want everyone to know like what a healthy like competition we have between each other, and like such a great relationship. Like I know when we play other teams, they're like screaming at each other, and I'm, I just like couldn't imagine that happening on our team, and I just feel so lucky to be a part of that. You're shaking your head like you're very proud of the I am. Of Grace and <laughs> I am proud all the of the other them. girls, yes. Yeah. Well that's you know, John and I talk about it all the time that, you know, we hope that we create more than just players out on the field, that we want these girls to remember a family and, you know, sometimes we may fall short, but if that's what they walk away with and they remember, then that's what we're most proud of. Sometimes, you know, we don't win that last game or we fall short a little bit, but if they walk away with something good in their heart, then we feel like we've won. Sounds like a lifetime uh, arrangement. Yeah. Yes. That's what we, you know, for we hope for. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we don't want them to just leave and never look back and be a part of our lives. We want them to always be a part of our lives. So it's not just, you know, what they, that win on the field. We want them to feel like this is a family that they can always come back to. And we've received dozens of emails and texts before the game from former players saying they're right there with us. And it's, it's a nice family. And, they come back each year. Sending we're, messages. We're very proud right? of that. From, from over, you know, outside the country and just remembering mm -hmm. the day that we played, you know, the, with people in other countries sending us notes, parents sending us notes after we won, the phone's blowing up. And, and to <laughs> me, that's, that's what's most important. Well, we've got actually another question from the same viewer who wrote in before uh, and asks, are you going to continue to play hockey in college? That would be for you, Grace. Yes, I am. I'm, I committed to play at Bates College next year. So. Playing there, yeah, I'm very excited. Good, mm -hmm. good. Is there incentive for that? The scholarship for for because it's D three, yeah. it's a NESCAC, so they don't give um, scholarships. But I'm getting great education, so I'm very excited. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And Lizzie, who couldn't be here with us tonight, she's playing at Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Another great institution. Mm -hmm. They they go for the education 
and they have other things other than field hockey. At Division One school, it, it's a full-time job. You know, Where they yeah. go, they're getting an elite education, playing field hockey, doing theater, traveling, going abroad, doing some of their courses. It's a well-rounded mm -hmm. experience that these girls are actually seeking out with their parents. So I'm very, you know, it's, very proud right. that they understand that they're, they're not going to be professional field hockey players. Because D1, <laughs> you can't travel, you know, you wouldn't be able to go abroad or do other things. You're totally, both Lizzie and Gracie could have played Division One, but yeah. they chose to go Division Three so that they can at least have a little bit of a life to do <laughs> something else. Hmm. Rob, anything else here? Uh, I, I'm wondering how everyone here got into field hockey. Um, <laughs> Grace, I'm sure you didn't start playing until seventh grade. Yes, well, we have some clinics before, so in like fourth and third grade, I believe I started playing. Yep. But I have an older sister, and I just like idolized her, and she played field hockey, so I wanted to be just like her, so <laughs> I played. <laughs> Coach Miller has a unique background that I'd like her to share with mm -hmm. you. She, she played at the elite level, and she sometimes doesn't share mm -hmm. that. And I think, you know, share it with the general. I, well, I played at Rhineck and we were one of the first state champions from this area. I played for a legendary coach that went there that's in the Hall of Fame, who I idolized. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I went on and played in college, played on the Junior Olympic team around when, way, 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 way back then, played Division One in college. And then when I stopped to have my first child, I was asked to coach at Mamaronek, and I started coaching there 18 years ago. I've been with John ever since. Mm. So. I was told by my AD, he brought me in, he says, John, we need a modified girl field hockey coach. I said, I really don't know anybody. He goes, no, you don't understand. <laughs> You're it. <laughs> so that was 1994. Next year I was the JV coach, then I was given the varsity, and I basically told a team that won the sectional championship the year before, you're going to take me wherever you want to go, girls, because I didn't tell them I had no clue, but I had no clue. <laughs> I think I have a little bit of a clue now, though. <laughs> I think you do, yes. <laughs> You've got three of those uh, plaques there to, to mm -hmm. prove it. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. The girls were very, very generous with getting us these three, getting us these three state championships. It's a, I'm proud to be a member of the field hockey program because of the young ladies we have. Are there other celebrations that are planned? The parents throw a nice dinner. Mm. They throw a nice dinner. Is that what, December 8th? I don't know what restaurant. Um, and then we get together, you know, and celebrate individually. There's always hugs and there's always smiles and there's always memories. And it might not be playing the bus ride, what happened here, some of the funny things that happened in the hotel. It's, it's mm -hmm. just an experience that I'm glad, I'm glad we're going, but we also say we'd like to come back winners. But just the experience these girls have, I think, it's something they'll remember for the rest of their life and winning and winning and being one of three teams that can say we finished our season with a win is a lifetime mm -hmm. memory. And I think you said before we started the show that you're going to give each of them a, a DVD? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that'd be mm -hmm. great. Appreciate that'd that. Be great. I love that. I love it. So uh, we're just about running out of time. I have one more mm -hmm. question for everyone. Uh, essentially, what are you all going to miss about the experience you had this year? Mm -hmm. Grace, what are you going to miss about playing for Savin Miller and, and coaches, what are you going to miss about Grace and really the rest of the senior class that's leaving now? Um, I'm probably just going to, there's going to be like a void in my heart that like it's going to be hard to fill like without the team and everything. And that feeling like when we won the state championship is, I'm going to miss that, but it's always going to be with me. I'm just going to miss the girls and Savin Miller. Hmm. Coach Miller? For me, it's like, you know, like my child, my daughter who is a freshman in college, it's like my own child leaving to go away, you know, to, to, to school. It's like these girls leave such an impression in your heart. You know, we're tough on them. I'm tough on them. Sav's a little softer, but I'm <laughs> tough on them. We are. We're very tough on them all year to get them to where they need to be, but they really, they really hold such a special place in my heart. So when they leave every year, it's really like a huge void. They're all so special. They work really hard. And sometimes we don't always tell them that because we want them to reach their potential, but we will miss all of them. They're all so special. So, um, you know, and they all leave such a special spot. So it's going to be hard to replace all of them. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it, there's two things. Number one, it's not the destination, it's the journey. And that phrase really rings true. And when John Wooden was asked, you know, what is he going to miss when he stepped away from coaching, the trophies, the tournaments, everything else, and I, I, I agree with him 100%, uh, he was going to miss the practices, being around those young mm -hmm. people, being part of it, teaching and learning, sharing. 
it's it's the journey I miss. It's the journey, mm -hmm. and uh, every year it's renewed again by different individuals. So I, I'm going to miss that journey I took with them. Now, Rob, I'm I, I'm grateful that they've extended to us part of their journey, being here tonight and sharing this with our uh, our home audience. Absolutely, mm -hmm. it's been fantastic. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, Grace Fitzgerald, Coach John Savage, Assistant Coach Trisha Miller. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, once again. And, and we'll be back uh, in a moment with the answer to that trivia question and more community stories. Stay where you are. On November 17th, our very own Rebecca Paganini attended a rehearsal of the highly anticipated performance of The Nutcracker the Musical at the Sandbox Theatre in Westchester. We have an exclusive inside look of what you can expect at the performance. Roll it. Hi everybody, I'm Rebecca Paganini and I'm here at the Sandbox Theater where it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Starting November 21st, The Nutcracker, like you've never seen it before. We had the opportunity to meet with Jason Summers, the Sandbox Theater's artistic director. So Jason, you guys have been advertising this production of The Nutcracker as a unique spin on a classic um, holiday favorite, so what can we expect? Uh, this is musical theater. This is not a ballet. There's not a tutu in sight. Well, they've taken all of that familiar music. They've put lyrics to it. It's very, very funny. It's fun for kids, adults, grandparents, all of that. Tickets are already selling really fast, and we, we just want the community to come out and see something completely different for the holiday season. And I think I remember reading you guys have a sister production going up in London. That's correct. At the same time it's premiering here in a few weeks, it will also be premiering in London uh, with a different company, different staff, uh, but it's happening here and in London at the same time, which is pretty cool. The cast features kids and adults alike and is led by local actors Kevin Brooks and Erica Ackerman. And it's been great because it's a nice combination of folks, uh, both locally and non-locally, getting together to do something for the holidays and for the community around us. Running at 2 hours and 15 minutes, this musical comedy opens on November 21st and goes until the 29th, with a total of nine performances. Tickets are already on sale. You can go to our website, wstshows.com. Tickets are only $20 for adults and $15 for students and seniors. I don't know that you can get a better ticket price anywhere. As you can see, the cast and crew are working tirelessly to reinvent this classic holiday tale. Get your tickets soon. They're selling fast. For The Local Live, I'm Rebecca Paganini. of the Lights Camera Action After School Club at Chatsworth Avenue School. We are learning how to use HD camera microphones and we even get to edit our own footage. We are having lots of fun and I can't wait to see ourselves on TV. Look for LMC TV's Lights Camera Action Club in your elementary school this coming winter and spring. Don't miss out on all the fun. Come to your BT8 for more information. Rebecca, our pet of the week is an adorable six-year-old Yorkie by the name of Snickers. He's, a, he's super friendly and gets along with other dogs and even cats. If you love a dog that likes to cuddle, then Snickers is definitely the dog for you. He's house trained and everyone at his foster home loves him. He's a great companion for a quiet adult home. For more information and to browse other adoptable pets, go to www.ny-petrescue.org. For more news and community programming, check out our website, www.lmctv.org. For internships and volunteer opportunities, send your emails to the local live at lmctv.org. We love hearing from you. That's the news for us this week. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Kat Galliano. And I'm Rebecca Paganini. Tune in next week for another edition of the local live. Tell us what you think. In person, over the phone, online. Watch and hear yourself on TV. You tell us, we air it. This is The Local Live.